Good evening. I'm Kate France. And I'm Tabby Tyler. Tonight we discuss Peace to Prosperity, a vision to improve the lives of the Palestinian and Israeli people. So grab a beverage. It's time for a night in. Hey, what does Trump's impeachment scandal and Benjamin Netanyahu's election and criminal charges have in common? I mean, besides corruption? (laughs) Well, I mean, yes. Uh, But they were both deflected by the release of the Trump administration's proposal for Israeli-Palestinian relations. Which, by the way, comes with a title straight out of the Trump family's collected works. It's called Peace to Prosperity, a vision to improve the lives of Palestinian and Israeli people. It sounds like you're selling me a resort. Right. (laughs) Please see this brochure. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's written by President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner is obviously qualified for the job. He infamously negotiated the peace treaty of um uh no i don't i don't think it was a treaty i think he drafted the peace accords um of well no that wasn't him either well wasn't it um wasn't it uh no i don't i don't think he did that one either no uh he actually hasn't done anything like this ever in fact the last time jared kushner had to negotiate for anything it was probably his prenup Exactly, which is evident by the decorous and diplomatic way he has handled the global community's responses to his proposed peace plan. Right? He said, quote, It's a big opportunity for the Palestinians, and they have a perfect track record of blowing every opportunity they've had in their past. Um, which isn't incendiary at all. It's a big opportunity for the Palestinians, and, you know, they have a perfect track record of blowing every opportunity they've had in their past, but... Perhaps maybe their leadership will... And it's really funny that he mentions uh, the past when he also said that to achieve peace, they must, quote, divorce themselves from all the history. And true to his word, Kushner's plan demonstrates what happens when you dismiss the region's past. Kushner and his teammates, Jason Greenblatt and David Friedman, directed their energy towards economic incentives and hopes for an economic prosperity, opting to take a more business-minded approach towards the peace negotiations. Which is the thing, Kushner and his team coming in with a fresh viewpoint on a very complicated issue could have been a huge asset that might have given the negotiations a real chance. However, aside from the Israeli President Netanyahu, who was thrilled with the proposal, pretty much upon release, the plan was met with a great deal of criticism. First and foremost, the plan was unilaterally dismissed by Palestine as completely being in favor of Israel. And President Abbas of Palestine called it a, quote, conspiracy deal and said, quote, we say a thousand times over, no, 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 end quote. And the Palestinian group Hamas, who controls the Gaza Strip, also rejected the deal, which it said aimed to, quote, liquidate the Palestinian national project. In Israel, the human rights group Salem called the proposals a form of apartheid, and Peace Now said the plan was, quote, as detached from reality as it is eye-catching. The UN, American Democratic leaders, and members of the international diplomatic community have also criticized the plan as being much too generous to the Israelis at the expense of the Palestinians, and also for not adequately addressing the refugee crisis in the region. The main points of the proposal included U.S. recognition of Israeli sovereignty over territory redrawn by the planned drafters. President Trump said that the new map will, quote, more than double the Palestinian territory and provide a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem. And yet also said that Jerusalem, quote, remains Israel's undivided capital. The plan also includes steps Palestine would have to take in order for the U.S. to recognize it as its own state. However, the details of this process are vague and stipulate that Palestine cannot have a military. Also, despite redrawn borders, Trump said, quote, no Palestinians or Israelis will be uprooted from their homes, end quote, which suggests that the existing Jewish settlements in the Israeli-occupied West Bank will remain. And the content of the plan is not the only issue under scrutiny. The Palestinians were not invited to draft the plan, nor announce it alongside Trump and Netanyahu. And Trump's actions thus far have indicated that he's not willing to negotiate with Palestine. In 2017, Donald Trump announced that the U.S. recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and ordered the relocation of the U.S. embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. 
which garners the question, what is the significance of the role the United States plays in this region? Our current administration is decidedly pro-Israel, yet Democratic candidates have increasingly showed support for Palestine. Do Americans have a grasp on how complicated the relationship between Israel and Palestine is? I had the opportunity to interview two people from Israel, and I questioned them in an effort to at least develop a better understanding of the complicated issues in the region. So I'm really fortunate to be able to sit here with Ido and Maya. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for talking to me. And what did you infer? Their points of views are representative of only one side of the situation, which gives credence to the fact that the region is divided. However, they concede to the fact that the situation is nuanced and complicated. I asked them about Netanyahu's policies that seem counter to peace, and here's what they had to say. Now, the relationship um, between Israel and Palestine is is a major topic of interest in American politics. And a lot of Democratic candidates uh, criticize Benjamin Netanyahu for being very aggressive with Palestine, um, for expanding on the Western Bank, for saying that he wants peace, but not then acting like he actually wants peace. Um, is this something you notice? Mm. I think it's up to the person you will ask him. Yeah. yeah, because some of the people will tell you that it, you have to be aggressive because it's war, and in war you have to be strong, otherwise you will lose. But I think you can say it, it's too aggressive, but I think you don't have to be so connecting with the Arabs that you will be, you will get to the situation that you have to choose between being aggressive or not aggressive, because if we will split... Like, we will have uh, different countries that I think we will be the solution. Not to a go to... Two-state solution. Yeah, yeah, not, a, not one state. Then you can you can choose, because if there will be a war, it's not will be, like, your fault, like, now, because it's, like, an army, army control, which is... Which is not good for sure. Everybody think it. In Palestine, it's yeah. army control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is like, it's like, it's not the, it's not right. You you can't you can't live like this so many years with the army controlling. And I think you have if you will split and you will have a different country, then you can start to discuss to talk about making peace. Maybe maybe not making peace. Whatever. But si- if maybe you're that's still the in difference. Mind. Americans are so far removed, it seems like a simple logistical issue. Whereas on the ground in Israel, the relationship between the two groups is still an armed conflict, which makes peace talks immeasurably daunting. Jared Kushner says that for peace to be achieved, we have to divorce ourselves from history. But you cannot begin to understand the state of the tensions in the region without acknowledging the history that has taken place. Though the history of the region spans over 4,000 years, the current tensions arose after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Abrahamic religions coexisted in the region that is the Levant for many years during the Ottoman rule. But the beginning of the 20th century brought an end to the Ottoman Empire. During the First World War, an Arab uprising, aided by the British, pushed the Ottoman Turks out of the Levant. The United Kingdom had agreed that they would honor Arab independence if they revolted against the Ottomans. And this is because the Ottomans had allied with Germany. Allied with Germany after they sought and were denied protection from the UK, France, and Russia. But yes, because the Ottomans were allied with Germany. Mm, The desire of the West to carve out a sphere of influence in the Middle East must have been a long time coming. And they used that desire to their advantage. After the war, France and the UK divided up the regions of the Levant, a move that was considered an act of betrayal to the Arabs. That set up a great precedent. Oh, yeah. That distrust of Western power is important for the rest of the story. The Mandate of Palestine followed, 
This region was designated by the League of Nations to be under British administration, but existed as a home for Arab Palestinians. Simultaneously, before and after the war, a Zionist movement sought to regain the Holy Land. The Balfour Declaration of 1917 was a British declaration of support for the establishment of a, quote, national home of the Jewish people in Palestine. And as such, many Jewish people began migrating to Palestine. Okay, wait. So, Britain broke up the Levant and administered the Mandate for Palestine, but also declared support of a Jewish territory within Palestine. Yeah. Which led to pretty immediate fighting between the Arabs and the Jews living in the region. For decades, tensions rose between the two nationalist movements. The German Nuremberg Laws of 1935 led to an increased number of Jewish immigrants fleeing Germany, and the increased immigration by Jews into Palestine led to the Arab Revolt of 1936 through 1939. As a result, Britain, while trying to prove to the Arabs that they're still totally friends, released the White Papers, a 1939 policy that was to limit the number of Jews immigrating into Palestine. This policy initiative was never enforced, though, because of the outbreak of World War II. World War II saw the brutal murder of approximately 6 million Jews and millions of others targeted for racial, political, ideological, and behavioral reasons. The Allied powers were criticized for not doing something sooner to stop the killing, but much of the activity in the concentration camps was kept secret, and reports that made it to the Allies were met with disbelief and incomprehension. How? They did not understand how operations of such scale could actually be taking place, the end of the war brought a massive displacement of Jewish individuals who were left homeless, and many, entirely familyless. On the 29th of November, 1947, the UN decided that Britain had helped enough and voted on a resolution to terminate the British mandate and release Britain from its administration over Palestine. Release. It was sort of like a forced resignation. They also voted to partition Palestine into two states while leaving Jerusalem as an independent international zone. The Zionists agreed. The Arabs did not. Immediately after Britain left, sectarian fighting ensued. This fighting became the Palestine War. The war saw the displacement of thousands of Israeli and Palestinian refugees. The 1949 armistice ended the war, but animosity remained high. The war resulted in Jordan annexing the region west of the Jordan River and granting Jordanian citizenship to Arabs who were residents of this region before the war. The Gaza Strip became the territory of Egypt, with Egypt supporting Arab interests in the region. Can you imagine surviving the Holocaust and then being called to arms immediately afterwards? Life must have appeared so hopeless and hostile. Absolutely hostile. Hostilities continued for another two decades, leading to the Six-Day War in 1967. As a result, Israel gained control of the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the formerly Jordanian-controlled West Bank of the Jordan River. Less than 10 years later came the Yom Kippur War, which began in October of 1973. It was orchestrated as a joint effort of Arab nations to reclaim the territory lost during the Six-Day War. Egypt wished to gain back the Sinai Peninsula, and Syria desired Golan Heights. Syria's forces were pushed back. A ceasefire was established, and peace talks followed. The Camp David peace talks between the U.S., Egypt, and Israel. Yes. In 1978, the Camp David peace talks resulted in Israel returning the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. Yet fighting continued. Where does Jerusalem stand in a two-state solution? Wow, it's it's a hard question. Yeah. (laughs) Because it's like, it's so old and everybody thinks it's on them. Right. I I don't really know. I don't think I have this solution. Yeah. It's too complicated. The late 80s brought the first intifada. 
The Intifada was a Palestinian uprising against Israeli occupation of Gaza and the West Bank. Through the first Intifada came the birth of Hamas, an offshoot of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas was born in the Gaza Strip and serves as a fundamentalist militant organization. The first Intifada ended in 1993 with the Oslo Peace Accords, and it gave Palestinians limited self-rule in occupied territories. The desire for independence among the Palestinians remained great, and after a few years of on-and-off negotiations, the Palestinians began a second uprising against Israel. The second intifada resulted in Israel removing its settlers from the Gaza Strip, and some from the West Bank. In 2006, Hamas became the governing party of the Gaza Strip, and has remained in power ever since. The West Bank is governed by the Palestinian Authority. Hamas is viewed by Israel, the United States, and the European Union as a terrorist organization. Palestine still desires a state of its own. Quote, As of February 2013, 131 of the 193 member states of the United Nations have recognized the state of Palestine. End quote. Israel, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and other nations do not recognize Palestine as a state. Do you think that if a two-state solution were achieved, Palestine has the ability to govern at its current state? No. no now I don't think they they able they don't believe in democracy still. They have a kind of democracy, but we know it's not right democracy. But after a few years, I think they will be. Will, they will understand. They will see. Like today in the world, everybody see. There is the, the Facebook and the YouTube, and everybody see everything. Yeah. Like you, you can see. You, they will understand. It will take years, but like maybe in f- fifty years from now, they will understand. They will become more democratic, and then you mm-hmm. can start making peace. Like maybe I don't know. In two hundred years, it will be like Europe. Like. One big country, I mm. hope, but now it could it couldn't no, be like this. We it's can't uh, make peace with uh, Hamas. It's not being the Human Rights Watch has criticized Israel for a number of infractions, stating, quote, The Israeli government continues to enforce severe and discriminatory restrictions on Palestinians' human rights, restrict the movement of people and goods into and out of the Gaza Strip, and facilitate the unlawful transfer of Israeli citizens to settlements in the occupied West Bank, end quote. In Palestine, both the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas in the Gaza Strip have been criticized for strongly restricting dissent and arbitrarily arresting and torturing critics of the government. Last year, many politicians and people of influence who criticized Israel for actions towards Palestine were accused of being anti-Semites. Which is truly powerful rhetoric given the pain and enduring prejudice Jewish people still feel, even today following the events of the Holocaust. Yet, if we're going to be involved in the politics of this region, we as a nation must be open to an unbiased dialogue about the actions of both parties. Citing anti-Semitism for criticism of human rights violations is counterproductive and dismissive of true anti-Semitism that is still prevalent today. Do you think that when people in the United States criticize Israel for some of the decisions and um, choices they've made, do you think that they are being anti-Semitic in doing so? I can understand it, uh, but it's much more complicated. I I think, yeah. I don't know. Um, I think Jewish also have to, because all the all our past, if it, if it's the Holocaust or much before, but we have so long history for anti anti-Semitic uh, and hate and like things like that, that we have to be much more like. I don't know how to say it, but like much more understanding and like to be more aware about situation who goes to this, this like. Uh, we are the the Jew. 
the Jewish. Need to be. Yeah, must mm. must more because our history we we saw uh, like a country a very very eastern country like Germany and they they like made so terrible thing but they are not was like they are not um, like the this Germany of 45 and 30, 30 39 there were like um Malavi. Mm. <laughs> like very western country you can say it yes but and they still like one one leader with a lot of charismatic he lead the whole country so you have to be a uh, much noticed like aware to right, this of to these things I think Israeli have to know it and not to go let things go to this direction mm-hmm. yeah yeah Thank you so much. As of today, the Trump plan for peace is moving forward through a joint U.S.-Israel mapping committee who has charted where Israel will begin the annexation of the West Bank. However, Palestine is still vehemently opposed to the plan, and in Washington, Trump is cautioning Israel not to move forward with the annexation yet. American ambassador to Israel David Friedman said, quote, I'm not suggesting that the government of Israel should not do whatever it wants to do. Israel is a sovereign state. But people should know that if the president's position is simply ignored, then we're not going to be in a position to go forward. <laughs> 